I'm going to introduce Dr. Osnovis, who is a friend of ours, and he has a very special task. He's going to summarize what cardiology learned in 2016 for all, all of us. He's going to summarize all the big trials. And the reason I think he's, he's perfectly perfect person for us is because he's trained in every aspect of cardiology. He's an interventional cardiologist, he's an electrophysiologist, he does everything under the sun at here at Houston Methodist, as well as San Jacinto. So, Reza. Thank you, Albert. <clears throat> My task today is trying to show you the top five cardiology trials in 2006, which is going to change our practice. Uh, surprisingly, when I started this, looked at the literature, it was not a, such a difficult task. Looking at the literature, it seems that we have some consensus in the top 10 trials of 2006. So I picked some of them, which I thought might be interesting for our non-cardiologist uh, community here also. Uh, for the sake of the time, I'll try to be fast in 10 minutes. Uh, at the Hope Tree trial was the trial which uh, always was on top of the most of the list I looked at it. It's basically a, tri as a, a primary prevention trial testing the polypill hypothesis. The question Hope trial is trying to address is, does a fixed dose statin, an antihypertensive agent, uh, decrease cardiovascular events in patients who are otherwise healthy, but they, they are in intermediate risk for cardiovascular events. Uh, the way they defined the intermediate risk was basically mostly a clinical uh, uh, approach. It was not like the uh, risk uh, scores we see with ASCVD risk scores we're using. If you were more than, uh, if you were a woman more than 60 years old or a man more than 55 years old, and at least had one of these risk factors, you qualify to be in intermediate risk. The study was a, um, uh, they randomized 12,000 patients in two by two factorial design to statins, resuvus statin 10 milligram a day and placebo. They further randomized each arm to candesertin and hydrochlorothiazide and placebo. This gave the opportunity to be able to control, to assess the effect of statins alone Candesertin or antihypertensive alone and resuve statin uh, plus uh, candesertin and hydrochlorothiazide combination compared to placebo to see what the effects are. Uh, the cardiovascular events basically were defined by conventional risk uh, um, uh, endpoints we usually use in our cardiology trials with composite endpoint, cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke. There were other comorbid, co-primary endpoints, which they added other meaningful cardiovascular endpoints, such as uh, resuscitated cardiac arrest, heart failure, revascularization, and also they added uh, stroke also as a secondary endpoint. The first arm was the placebo versus uh, antihypertensive agents. Antihypertensive agents dropped the blood pressures as expected, average of six millimeter in, uh, mercury in systolic blood pressure. But this didn't translate to any meaningful clinical outcome improvement in, uh, in meeting the endpoint. Uh, there was a pre-specified subgroup of this uh, trial, uh, which uh, was based on the baseline blood pressure, and that was the higher tertial blood pressure, uh, uh, which seems that a patient in this, in this subgroup, they benefited from uh, antihypertensive agents. Again, these are the patients. They don't have hypertension. They don't have hyperlipidemia. You're giving antihypertensive to drop the blood pressure because there was some evidence that dropping the blood pressure might improve the outcome. So this didn't pan out, except there was in subgroups uh, of this uh, population. What about the statins? Statins did what they were supposed to do. They dropped the LDL level by uh, 25%. Uh, there was, however, a significant improvement in outcome, cardiovascular outcome, and uh, there was an incremental benefit by time in, the car in the, all the cardiovascular uh, endpoints we had. You saw, we saw, they saw this in stroke, in coronary artery disease, and uh, th this benefit was independent of their subgroup uh, uh, um, of the patients. It was independent of the baseline LDL level, 
It was independent of the uh, blood pressure, independent of C-reactive proteins, and most importantly, independent of the eth ethnic background. Most of the trials we have on primary prevention measure, primary prevention trials, mostly are white population dominated. This was a global trial, and it was a very uh, balanced um, ethnic background in the uh, population. Was it safe? The answer was yes. And uh, the concerns about uh, diabetes, the concerns about uh, dementia, erectile dysfunction with statin didn't pan out in this trial. Um, how about the uh, combination of antihypertensives and statin? Did they improve the outcome? The trend was the same as statin, as you saw, and the impact of the benefit was incremental by time. It was seen again with all the endpoints in this trial, and uh, the question was, what was the impact of, additional impact of antihypertensive to statins in improving the outcome? As you see in this uh, first uh, 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 figure, the impact seems to be negligible in the whole trial. So the majority of the benefit was by ad uh, administration of statins. However, in the pre-specified subgroup, which we discussed, in a higher uh, blood pressure, baseline blood pressure, which in this study panned out about 140 millimeters of mercury, it seems that addition of antihypertensive agents to statins uh, significantly improved the outcome. So um, was it safe addition of the antihypertensive ag agent to patients who don't have, to don't qualify to have hypertension? And the answer was yes. They didn't see too much renal failure. They didn't see too much uh, orthostatic hypotension. Some might increase in dizziness. So in summary, this was a trial which tested the polypill policy, polypill concept in patients with primary prevention um, uh, with intermediate risk, and it showed, be, it showed that it was beneficial. But there was a big but that uh, it, sh it, sh it, it was dependent on the patient population to a certain degree. If you didn't have a high, higher blood pressure, addition of blood pressure medicines to quote unquote healthy uh, non diabetic, non hypertensive patients, should, it was not working. So this raise some question that one shoe for this polypill concept, one shoe might not fit all. And we have to be careful where to apply this polypill policy. There were some additional benefits also. One was about the uh, eff efficacy and safety of this st statin in elderly and also in uh, different ethnic populations such as Asians, which Dr. Jones mentions. This study showed they were all uh, benefited. There was concern about the long-term statin use and uh, side effects. They didn't see any diabetes. They didn't see any major side effects. Um, and then also further validated the uh, current practice we have. Uh, the uh, placebo 10-year uh, risk estimate on this patient was about 7 to 10%. This is the right, exactly what risk current guidelines tell us to start statin therapy. Um, I uh, go to the second trial, which also was very interesting for me, was the uh, use of no anticoagulants, no acts, with aspirin or Plavix. The data is very limited. As you know, we have so far two trials, both in acute coronary syndrome population. One was uh, uh, terminated because of the safety concern, a praise trial. In the second trial, at last two trial, didn't, meet the, didn't in, uh, come to the guidelines because the benefits of the uh, an acute coronary syndrome outcomes didn't, was much less uh, compared to risk of bleeding. So bleeding uh, risk is very uh, um, uh, significant uh, with uh, uh, addition of antiplatelets and NOACs. This is the third trial and currently the best trial we have, how to use uh, no anticoagulants with antiplatelet therapy. 2,100 patients were with AFib uh, who underwent coronary bypass surgery were randomized in three different arms. The bottom arm was the conventional treatment, a little bit different what we do right now, but uh, pre-specified uh, triple therapy uh, period, followed by aspirin and coumadin, which we right now are based on Woods trial of common practices, usually coumadin plus Plavix. Now, there was two uh, strategies also based on the NOACs, rivaroxaban, but in a very, very lower doses. 
If the, they use a triple therapy, they use a very low 2.5 milligram BID rivaroxaban with aspirin and Plavix for pre-specified time, followed by rivaroxaban of 15 milligram and aspirin and, uh, uh, alone. There was one arm also, they didn't even use triple therapy, they used only rivaroxaban. The endpoints was basically initially the safety endpoint, the bleeding problem, but they added a secondary endpoint, the cardiovascular death and MI and stroke, to assess some efficacy also. The triple therapy period was defined either one month, six months, or 12 months, and was pre uh, uh, defined by a cardiologist prior to random randomization. And this was based on the patient characteristics, bleeding risk, or angiographic characteristics, how difficult the stent is. The result was very promising. Both uh, uh, NOAC-based treatments significantly decreased the bleeding. This was a TIMI major, minor, and clinically relevant bleeding. How about the efficacy? The efficacy uh, uh, trial this trial was not powered to see a meaningful efficacy. Uh, um, um, it was not powered enough to see a meaningful efficacy, but whatever we had was clinical, out, clinical uh, endpoint, it uh, was identical in three groups. Hospitalization was much less in the NOAC-based strategy, and also this was both for bleeding and also for cardiovascular events. So, this trial in summary, this uh, trial in summary uh, showed a decrease in uh, mortality or hospitalization, decrease in bleeding hospitalizations, decrease in cardiovascular event uh, hospitalization, uh, and also uh, decrease the cost and looked to be uh, easier to use. So is this the end of the uh, full, triple, full dose triple therapy with Coumadin? I think we have to be very careful. Um, we have to wait for the three more trials coming very soon uh, to see uh, what those uh, data sh uh, show us. If they follow the same trend, I think we might be reaching that end, that, uh, end of the triple therapy with Coumadin. Now, word of caution, again, this study was not powered enough to see the efficacy of this uh, uh, rivaroxaban-based uh, strategy with much lower doses. So take home message for us, it used to be criminal to use uh, NOACs and dual antiplatelet therapy, but now we have uh, uh, data uh, to support it. If you are using it, you have to use it at least based on this protocol with lower dose of rivaroxaban for the time being, the only available data, and don't use the new generation uh, P2Y2 uh, potent P2Y12 inhibitors, uh, Effian and Brilenta with them. The third trial was, uh, um, um, the trial, again, the secondary prevention trial is the PCSK9 trial, Evolocumab, and the trial was a Fourier trial. The, uh, the concept, the, uh, this, the objective of this trial was that in patients with established cardiovascular events, does addition of Evolocumab, which is a PCSK9 inhibitor, reduces the incidence of clinical endpoints, major cardiovascular events. And also to see long-term use of these agents is safe. And last but not least, uh, challenge the concept of the lower LDL, the lower you go, the better. Uh, about 27,000 patients who had prior MI, prior stroke, or symptomatic peripheral vascular disease were, uh, um, uh, 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 who were taking aspirin and or zetamide, they, uh, um, they were randomized uh, who they didn't have the LDL level, the LDL level was more than 70. 70. They were randomized with abulcumab versus uh, placebo, and the uh, uh, endpoints were the routine conventional endpoint. There was expected 60% drop in uh, um, um, LDL level, and the cardiovascular outcome was definitely statistically significantly better in uh, addition in uh, abulcumab arm. Uh, this was independent of the subgroups of studies, independent on the level of the LDLs. And um, uh, so in summary, this study also showed their LDL, we can re reduce the LDL as the phase two, phase three trials. Outcomes gets, uh, so this is translated to significant up to 20 to 30% reduction of outcomes and the lower levels of LDL, uh, the, this strategy very well tolerated. 
Uh, they didn't see any uh, diabetes. They didn't see any uh, dementia or neurocognitive disorders. So uh, all the endpoints were met in this trial. How much time do I have left? I'm just stretching. Okay. So, <laughs> so just brief also, I think I know like five, I have here like three or four minutes left. Uh, two more trials I want to add. One was the study of the uh, role of stenting in um, uh, left main disease. Excel trial was presented last year. And this study uh, actually basically assessed the uh, effect of and efficacy and safety of the left main stenting in patients uh, with left main disease. They had a very strict criteria. And as Dr. Ramchandani mentioned, they, they use a syntax score to assess the anatomical uh, uh, complexity of the lesions. Non-complex lesion, low or intermediate complex lesion, very enrolled, and the uh, endpoints, very conventional endpoints. And uh, this study was a uh, non-inferiority trial, and it shows that left main stenting in this trial was as, um, uh, efficace, as uh, non-inferior to bypass surgery. And the last trial was also the partner trials and Sir Tavi trials. With Dr. Kleiman, I think, went through it. The main uh, um, um, uh, message was this was the first time they showed that balloon expandable and also self-expanding uh, percutaneous valves uh, in intermediate risk patient population was uh, as efficacious, if not better, in surgery. So with that, I stopped. And yeah. thank, you. thank you so much.